Hello everyone, I'm Mateusz. Um, I historically did um, the Android apps only, and uh, this eventually made me part of the Google Developer Expert program on Android. Uh, nowadays, I'm trying to apply some of my Android practices within the iOS world, working within, uh, with, the, with the iOS team as well. Um, and yeah, guess what? Some of the, some of those, uh, some of those tips actually work cross-platform. Uh, so I thought that I know this is a DevFest conference. You all, you are all Android developers, right? Most of you are. Raise your hand if you are. Most of you are, right? So for those of you who are not, I hope you will still find this presentation useful. Um, and I will have a couple of questions uh, in the meantime during the presentation. So I count on you for this presentation to succeed. So today we're going to talk about how to write better tests with the emphas emphasis on the, uh, on the unit tests. So the first question I have, why do we write unit tests? Or if you don't, because I know some people don't. I mean. This is this is not a secret. I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna blame anybody. Uh, but why do you think we write them in the first place? What are the goals uh, for us spending so much of our time writing those little pieces of code that are testing a small pieces of our production code? We we can refactor the code later. Right. That's one example. What else? Sorry? To, to prevent the bugs. Yes. So I have a couple of those things on the slide. To reduce the amount of bugs. I mean, if you speak to lots of people, they will tell you that the main goal of the unit test really is to drive the architecture in a certain way so that it's maintainable. But if that would be the primary case, we wouldn't be executing the unit test as part of our, as part of our uh, continuous integration plans. So yeah, one of the goals is to reduce the bugs, reduce the amount of the manual testing, make refactoring easier, and to make the architecture better. Uh, also to not be afraid of uh, talking to people at the conference and talking to the speaker who uh, sacrifices 45 minutes of your life to talk about the unit tests. Uh, anyways, the main common goal, as with every single good practice, is to uh, make you faster, make your team faster uh, in delivering a stable product long term, right? So that's. Hope we all agree that this is uh, that this is the this is the ultimate goal. But you know, we have a small group here, right? It's not a giant audience, so we can be honest with each other. How often do you feel they make you slower instead? Right? How, often, how often do you hear that sentence? Right? You come to the daily stand-up, 9.30, for those that are lucky, 1 p.m. Everybody stands in a circle, waiting to just get out of the room. And then you hear the same person for the seventh time, the seventh stand-up in a row telling you, yeah, my PR is almost ready, but I need to fix those freaking 500 tests that failed because I changed 100 different files. Familiar with that? Don't lie to me. This happens. This happens a lot. So why does it happen, right? One of the reasons is that your tests are too dependent on the implementation. The other one, and tests are not checking for things properly, really. Uh, sometimes you just have a wrong definition of unit. We're going to talk a little bit about that uh, further down the presentation. Or you have some tests for the sake of testing, which I'm also going to touch on. So there are loads of projects uh, that I've seen that are demanding the unit test on kind of a code review level, and uh, developers are uh, committed to do the unit test, and they have like a 997 unit test passed, zero confidence gained. Right? We all have been there. 
I remember the first years when uh, I was basically starting within the Android development, and then there was this kind of a boom within the Android conferences world uh, where everybody was talking about testing. Because testing on Android was so hard and so uncommon that it was basically a first-class citizen on the conferences. We had RoboElectric, some people were writing the unit test with the Android unit test class, the legacy instrumentation class that nobody, nobody, uh, nobody is using nowadays. And there have been tons of the approaches. And, you know, this felt me, um, this, this felt me feel necessary that this is, this is something I need to do, right? So we started, uh, I convinced people within my team to do that. And this is actually one of the examples of how we were approaching it at the beginning. We had loads of tests, but they were actually testing nothing. We still had bugs on prod, the architecture wasn't great, and each time we were changing something bigger, the test had to be rewritten. I'm going to talk today a little bit about Mokito, uh, which is, I guess, a pretty common tool for everybody that is doing the uh, doing the unit testing, even if you are not using it nowadays, you were using it before, and now you are using a similar tool. So I want to tell that this is a great tool. It makes stabbing easy. It makes mocking things easy. It makes verification of, your, uh, of the interactions with your mocks easy. But I will show you also why it makes writing a test that copies the implementation way too easy. And uh, what are the boundaries of something I consider a good use case for mocks. So I came up with the idea for a very simple Android app. It's using the MVP, but all the problems I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna be mentioning on are also applicable in the MVVM world. So we have a view. This is some kind of the interface uh, that is implemented by a fragment activity or a custom Android view. Then there is a presenter, uh, which basically invokes some methods on our uh, invokes some methods or methods on our view interface. And in case it would be a view model, it basically emits some events that are then consumed by the view. We have the repository, which is wrapping the, some interface coming from the retrofit and the repository does a mapping inside and maps the API, the data structure into the uh, into the structure of the uh, into the structure of, of the business model, right? So we have a presenter which looks like this. Everybody is using the dark theme. Lesson learned, don't use the dark theme on the conference slides. Hope you can still see it, right? So we have a code more or less like that. The get people as get users method returns a single that contains uh, that contains a list inside. We are then mapping it to the list of string because we are just interested in getting the list of the usernames, and then we subscribe. We hide the progress or and then set names. And in case there is an error because it involves the I/O operation, we show an error. So, what tests do you think we should write? What scenarios, what unit test scenarios would you write for that class? Right? Okay, I will help you. First, the success, the happy path scenario, show names, right? So we have a mock of our repository. It's mocked using Mokito. We mock it in a way so that it does return a single containing a single user and then attaches the view and verifies the, the, verifies the uh, interaction on the view. So that the view is a mock here and the repository is a mock here, right? The other scenario, we are showing the progress. To show the progress in a reliable way, we make our repository mock return a single never. For those of you who are less familiar with Eric's Java, this basically means that we'll subscribe to it and it will emit nothing. It's like infinite infinite loop. It will never finish the processing, right? So if that situation would occur in the real application, you will see the indefinite progress. So you test that. Then when the success appears, right, apart from showing the list of names, you also want to make sure that you hide the progress, right? Otherwise, you will have a recycler view displaying the list of strings, and then you will have a progress bar on the top of it. Uh, this is the test you can write to verify that. Some people would prefer uh, to, oh, actually, uh, actually there is a bug on the bottom of the slide because it should verify that we call the height progress. Uh, 
some people would uh, some people would prefer to write this assertion, this verification on the bottom on the uh, in the first uh, in 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 the first test instead. So there will be two verifications, one that is checking for set names, the other one that is hiding the progress within the same test. I decided to I decided to split them down. To be honest, it doesn't really matter. And then we have a test for the error case. So we mock our repository to return the I.O. exception. We attach the view. We expect the error to happen. OK, very common scenario. For tests, for tests passed. All done, right? PR can be opened. Code can go to production. Nothing will ever break. We have a test. So. There is one bug. I won't be torturing you with uh, squeezing your eyes to see the slides, especially from that part of the room. Uh, but there is one bug, right? We hide the progress whenever we whenever we set the names. We don't hide the progress uh, whenever we show the error, right? So one bug. Remember that sometimes it might happen that even if you have tests and all of them are passing, the test that would fail otherwise is not existing. So that's the rule we always need to remember. This is why, apart from the unit tests, we create different layers of testing just to make sure that our application works. And in the end, you actually want to do some exploratory testing to run it at least once manually to verify that it actually starts. So that's a bug. You write another test. If there is an error, we hide the progress before we show the error. OK, let's take a look on the, uh, and this, is, this, test was th this test was obviously failing, so we're adding the view height progress to the owner or callback. Tests are passing. Job done? No. I will tell you, about, I will tell you a word about the technique uh, that I am personally using to review my own code before I open the PR. I actually recommend it that before you open the PR, uh, you actually verify it yourself. And one of the ways of doing that is you basically attempt to open a PR, you look through the divs, you look through the comments, and you make sure that you comment on your own PR, you comment on your own code to spot the things that you would spot on other person's code. Right? That's a good thing to do. The other thing to verify the correctness uh, of your code is to play a little bit of a ping, uh, ping pong game. You can do that actually in a pair. You don't have to do that alone, as, with, as it usually is with a ping pong game. So ping pong pairing is actually a pretty common thing uh, within the agile development, let's say. Uh, so the way it usually works is that you have two people working with each other. One person is writing the production code implementation. The other person is writing the test. So the first person writes a test that fails. The other person needs to make it green. Then the person that writes the test needs to write another test that will fail. And it goes, right, till the implementation is finished. For the purpose of the unit testing and verifying that they actually work, uh, I tend to kind of a rever reverse this game a little bit. So you have the tests. You think that they are ready to be ready for the review, ready to go to be checked in uh, to, your, to your master branch and you have a production code, what do you do? You intentionally change your production code to make your tests red. You are basically verifying whether your tests are testing anything. I really love this technique. I recommend it to, any, to, to everyone. Sometimes it just takes five minutes. You put one line here, one line there, you, co you confirm that tests are red. Uh, and this, this, this way you test the quality of your tests. Right, so what we can do here, um, let's write something like that. We will just intentionally add view show progress behind the height progress, right? So those methods are contradicting each other. So it's like you would, not, you would call nothing. But as you remember, we had the test that was verifying whether we call height progress on the mock, right? But this test wasn't verifying that we didn't call show progress. Actually, if it would do that, it would still fail because our do on subscribe calls show progress. So what you need to do, because tests are still passing, 
Either you do some weird combination of verify plus times, or you do the in order mock, mock uh, in order mock verification, or way or argument captors and different magic, just to make this test red in case this happens. And this is how you cement the, c the implementation of your production code to your test. Your tests aren't testing the behavior of your class in that scenario. They are testing whether this particular class that is being tested is written in the particular way. And this is what makes it slow to refactor. This is what makes it not helpful to refactor because tests should help you in refactoring in a way that you refactor the stuff. You run the test after the refactoring, they are still green. If you make your test follow the implementation, in the best case scenario, they will be red. In the most common scenario, the code of the test will not even compile. We all have been there. So I'll tell you a little bit about fakes. So whenever you are using MVP or MVVM, the view that you have is keeps the state. The, even if you don't keep any kind of a variable within your fragment activity or whatever, the hierarchy of the view has some state. Some views are hidden, some views are shown, some views are resized in a certain way. There is something on the screen that keeps the state, right? And preferably you want to uh, retain that state whenever you, whenever, for example, you rotate the screen. So let's make our test view keep the stage two and we'll see how it impacts our test. So I told you that the user's view is basically an interface that is implemented by some fragment. So instead of just mocking it, we'll just create a fake implementation. Right? So we implement the interface, we keep some variables that keep the state, and then the methods, the public interface methods of the user's view are modifying that state and are keeping it. Then we are adding a couple of different methods to the same fake view that will help us to the assertion, right? So those, those tests are actually, th th those methods are actually part of your test. So when you display the names, you not only, you are not only interested about making sure that the names are displayed, but you want to make sure that the error is hidden, you want to make sure that the progress is hidden. If the progress is shown, you don't want to show the error, you want to show the progress, you don't want to show the recycler view. And if the error is shown, you want to show the error, you don't want to show the progress, and you don't want to show the recycler view, right? In a very basic scenario, depending on the use case. And then, those are the only tests you need to write, the three of them. Show names, you mock the repository, but you don't mock the view. You have a fake implementation of the view. You make it return a single user, and then you just attach whether it did uh, the job. Right? You check the state, not the interactions. Same for show progress, same for show error. In fact, we eliminate, by this approach, we completely eliminated the need for a testing the height progress method. Right? It's being tested by checking for the internal state of our fake view, but we don't need a specific use case that is testing that. This is also making our tests more, more, uh, more readable. This is also making our tests follow what the user basically needs. Only free tests. And this trick, if we will try to now add the height progress to our own error callback, it will fail because it will, ch uh, if, uh, if we will actually, sorry, if we would add the show progress uh, to this, uh, to this, on, to this on, uh, on success callback, to this first callback. I was doing the slide after the speaker's dinner yesterday, I'm sorry. Uh, you get the point, right? You get the point though. Okay. So when to use it? Views are a good example. Uh, but overall, everything that keeps the state and maintains the state, uh, I would at least think whether the fake will not make it better uh, than, uh, than using the pure mock. Uh, avoid treating the verify as a proof of state. Verify is a proof that some particular verification has happened. Uh, but especially if you have a different methods that are modifying the same state, uh, going with verify is quite problematic. 
Uh, this doesn't work only for views. UI also wants to use it for some kind of the use cases or in the interactors. Imagine that our repository is actually a use case uh, and you have two use cases. One is the one that is retrieving the users from the repository and the other one that is removing the users from the repository. Right? And you have two different use cases implementing two different interfaces. Instead of mocking them, you create two fake implementations that are modifying a common state. Right? So they are referencing one state that is known for both of them, keeping the list of users. If you invoke one interactor, it just returns whatever was there on the list. If you invoke the other interactor, it removes the particular item from that shared memory state. Right? And then you don't have to use Mokito at all. And your tests are much shorter and much more reliable and much more proof for any refactoring that you want to do. This advantage is that you need to extract an interface in order to do that. Right? That's a big advantage of Mokito. Uh, that if, if you are using the MockMaker plugin, that you can mock final classes. Right? You don't need an interface. Uh, you, don't need this, you don't need that boilerplate. Uh, for views, it doesn't matter because you create the interface anyways uh, with, the, with the MVP pattern. Uh, for use cases, depending on how you structure your architecture, this might generate some additional boilerplate, but believe me, more often than not, if you want to verify the end state of your test subject, it's worth it. Okay, another thing. We have a data class, which we construct in our tests in a certain way. And yes, partition is my name on GitHub, which I'm trying to advertise since the beginning of this presentation. So we have the user, we have the username. And I will show you something that I hope you all remember seeing at least once in your development careers. We had another field. We had 200 tests that were somehow using and manipulating the user class. Bam, they don't compile anymore, right? You need to go through all those places now and add this, add this full name thing, right? So what quite a handful amount of people do, they do this, right? You can create a mock of the data class with Mokito. That's not a problem. And then you don't have to care. You remove, your, you remove the coupling between your test implementation and the list of fields uh, that your data class uh, has inside. What I suggest instead, and it's a pretty common pattern, I wouldn't be surprised if all of you know it, um, you create a file or a set of files or an object that is basically a factory of the data objects that is creating them in a certain way and has the default parameters to, uh, has the default parameters to, to the constructor. So in test, you are only specifying those values, those values that you are actually interested in, that are actually relevant in context of what you are testing. The thing, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there is any open source tool that is able to do that uh, automatically. Uh, but yeah, that's the most basic scenario uh, you can follow. Another thing I would like to mention is the um, difference between the unit test and a class test, because those are not the same things. More often than not, developers treat a class as a unit. And again, more often than not, they are right. More often than not, the class is actually a pretty good boundary for the unit, but not always, right? And, uh, and the answer isn't really clear, right? Because I created the spec just for the presenter that is there. Some other people, like people that work within, the, within me in the company, uh, would rather treat the whole thing as the unit. And rather than mocking the repository, they would actually inject the real implementation and test those things together. And you can ask the question whether where is the boundary of the unit test and where does the integration test start, right? But the answer isn't really clear and really depends on the context. 
you really need to go by the, uh, by the individual basis. Sometimes, in this particular case, the user's repository and user's list presenter, they don't make, us, they don't make sense without each other. So you might want to decide to test them together to reduce the amount of the test. Especially in case your user's repository is just a dump wrapper over the user's API and doesn't do any logic inside. That could be a reasonable thing to do. On the other hand, if your user's repository is actually doing some more complex mapping logic that might break, then perhaps you want to create a separate unit test classes for those two. Um, so in our case, the user list presenter is just a presentation layer. It's communicating the view, accepting events, uh, mapping, mapping them to the view interactions. The user's repository is wrapping the API and mapping to the API model into the business model. For the purpose of this presentation, I won't tell you what is the preferred solution because I genuinely believe that there is none. I genuinely believe that each of you writing the test will need to make that decisions together with your team uh, because it depends on way too many factors. But I will show you a quote, and it's pretty lengthy, but at least it's on the bright background, so you can clearly read it. This is Martin Fowler, the, the guy that wrote the refactoring book. Um, so what he basically says is that, well, he basically says what I just said, because I said what I read uh, from the guy here, that it's really hard to provide you with any kind of a generic generic tip uh, that would tell you exactly what and when is the definition of unit, what and when should be tested in one unit test and what should be tested in a couple of new unit tests. The thing that you need to remember is that your tests need to run fast. So, so there is no option that you will, that you should ever do any IO stuff, any database uh, connection or any uh, network calls, right? This is without a doubt breaking the definition of the unit test. But once you rule that out, the things get more complicated. And um, the last sentence of this quote is probably what you need to do, what you need to read the most is like, however you define it, it doesn't really matter as, ma as, as long as you are, as long as you are keeping your test maintainable and they are doing the job for you. Knowing what to test is as much important as knowing how to test. Uh, so I'll tell you also a couple of words of what I'm not unit testing. Uh, the configuration stuff. So imagine you have a class that keeps a map of the country code to the privacy policy link. Everybody has a privacy policy nowadays because that's the requirement of the Google Play, right? Your test would be basically a copy paste of your implementation, right? You wouldn't write it again, all the same thing again. You would just copy paste the map and execute it, right? And whenever you would add anything and any other country or remove any country, you would just, without even thinking, you would do the same in the same in your test, right? This test doesn't really provide you with much of the value because it's basically a copy paste. It shouldn't make you feel more confident that you wrote the same code in two places, and this way it's less likely to break. No, because it will be your instinctual reaction that you will just, whenever you feel that this test is broken, you will just go and do whatever you did, you've done in the, in the first implementations. <laughs> Third party API wrappers. Um, I'm not sure if you know the Twitter for J library. Uh, so there is a rich client over the Twitter API uh, providing some, hand, mm, some handy wrapper in Java for it, and all you do is you extract the interface that mimics the public methods of the library, and your implementation is just delegating, and you do that because you want to mock it out in your unit test, or you want to mock it out in, uh, in your UI test, for example. Uh, so, yeah, doesn't make much sense. The code is so trivial and it's just a copy of the implementation that just writing a test over the 20 methods and verifying whether they invoke the same method with the same name and return the same value 
the risk of this being broken is tiny. And it doesn't really get smaller if you'll just copy, the, the copy your product should be implementation there. Because this is what they are. One more word on the Mokito. It is all right, it's a great tool. I'm still using it and I'm not advocating against it. It's a great tool for the certain use cases. So for example, if you are mocking the behavior of stateless method, the set retrofit interface that just returns something, pretty much mock it out, right? You would need to write slightly more code in order to, in order to achieve the same behavior. So it doesn't really matter if this is stateless, do whatever takes less uh, less lines of code if you are already using Mokito in your project. Verifying that some even occurred when the subject doesn't care about the result. Uh, so I find Mokito pretty useful in, a ca in case you have some kind of a class which you just communicate that some event happened and you don't care about the result. It's like a fire and forget. Uh, then Mokito is pretty useful as well because you then you don't have to extract the interface, etc. Uh, this could be, for example, tracking. Right? If, the, if there is something very important to track and you invoke some method on your test subject and you want to make sure that it's tracked in a proper way, then Mokito versus the fake implementation on stop doesn't really make much of a difference. That's my opinion. So go and test, and each time you find your tests you to be a bad one, just spend a little bit time thinking within the team, together with your teammates, whether there is a way of not repeating the mistake again and making, our te making your test suit more suitable to what you want to achieve doing the refactoring or what you want to achieve by uh, introducing the bug. The same way when you find the bug, you typically start or typically try to write a test that replicates that bug in order to not let this bug happen again. Each time you do a seemingly is a refactoring and you see 17 tests broken, this should raise the same instinct. Like, okay, what should I do? How should I fix my tests so that they facilitate refactoring instead of making it harder? That's all I had. I wonder if you have questions. I will tell you a secret. I haven't logged into Slido. I was expecting that somebody will be here with a phone reading them out loud. But I'm more than happy to answer them. And I will repeat the question so that everybody hears. More than happy to answer them in the old fashioned way without the technology. All right, I will be here around uh, for another couple of hours. Feel free to approach me. Feel free to disagree with me. Uh, hopefully we can have a meaningful conversation. Uh, and yeah, enjoy the rest of the event. Oh, there is a question, sorry, no. Don't disable the camera. Or uh, actually, let's wait for the question and we'll see whether to disable the camera. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a good question. So for the unit test, basically everything apart from, mm, apart from the things I listed down and similar stuff. Um, for, let's go from the other way now. For UI tests, uh, I treat them in a way that they're like a lifesaver in case everything goes, uh, didn't find a bug, UI test should at least make sure that what you're gonna ship to production is not, uh, is, is not gonna go, is not gonna make your company bankrupt, right? So with the UI test, you test the most common paths of the user that are essential for the users to do whatever job they need to do within the app. Right, so I work at IG, we do the trading apps. For us, this is trading. So buying or selling the markets, that's the most common action, or depositing the money to your account, this kind of things, right? We have 
couple of features that are mo less recently used, like imagine the feedback form, right? That you go to some place in the app, there is a text area, you put some stuff in there, you press the button and it sends the feedback, right? If that breaks, that's a shame, but it's not gonna make, it's, it's not gonna cause a disaster, right? So for this particular thing, the UI test, which is running for some time, uh, might not be worth the effort, right? If you have the unit test. Um, for the integration test, um, it really also depends on the on the nature and the and uh, and the definition of the integration test. Um, so I will be honest with you. I think that we ourselves at my company we approach the integration test in a slightly wrong way. Sorry, Dima. Um, what the good integration test would be is that it's actually in testing the integration with some third-party system that you don't necessarily have a control on. We've been rather tricking it as testing a bunch of different classes. Right? So for the integration test, you also integrate with the APIs that are kind of a most used, maybe you broaden the broaden the amount of the most used feature because the integration tests are typically quicker uh, than the UI test. You prioritize the things that are more likely to break, that you trust less, let's say, and you write the integration test for them. It's really on the it's 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 really to be ruled on the on the individual basis, I would say. I don't think that there is the gold and silver bullet rule that everybody should follow. Yeah. So the UI tests that we have, they are testing the whole flow as the user would do them. Right, so you could potentially just start a particular activity or whatever that you want to test in this particular context. We go the full flow. So you open the app, you log into the app, you do something there. Some of our UI tests are using the mocked environment, so sometimes we just have a kind of a mocked JSONs uh, in order to make those tests run quicker or to decouple our test plans from any breakages that might happen on the sandbox environment. But yeah, it's going through the full flow. Again, something that's suitable for us doesn't necessarily need to be suitable for your project. So treat it as a tip, not the golden rule. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the that's a very good question, which we had lots of problems with, and the account state, for example. Uh, in the ideal world, I will try to provide the answer that is not coupled to our own implementation details. In the ideal world, when you run those tests against the real environment, you are able to create an independent account on this environment for the sake of that test. And then perhaps you are even able to set it up before you, if in, in case there are some requirements for this test to run. Right? You want to test some the user, like you have a to-do app, you want to test the user that has three to-dos on the list, right? In the ideal world, your UI test should start by invoking some script that will create the account, quickly create those two, uh, those two nodes, and then execute the UI test and see whether it's behaving in a proper way. If you are using the mocked environment, you can achieve this pretty easily. But what the mocked environment doesn't, uh, so mock, like a mock web server, right, that returns you, re returns, returns, you, returns you the JSON. But what it doesn't help with is when you are mutating the state from within the app. Right, you create a new task, and then you expect that this task will appear on the list of tasks. The mock, the mock web server doesn't really facilitate that behavior. Right, so I know it's a problem. We haven't really managed to achieve what I told you with this 
create a pre-configured account. So our tests are pretty fat at the moment. And uh, in case they want to check some particular state, they are kind of merged into another test, like this is a single test that is first creating that state and then verifying how the app behaves with that state. So in the to-do example, you would go to the create to-do screen, create a couple of to-dos, then go to the list of to-dos and verify whether they are all there. So, yeah. I understand the pain. Lima too, he is my colleague. Thanks for questions, they were super valid. Uh, you really win the ticket to uh, the, the GDG Krakow Android Tech Talks meetup. We have free tickets and free pizza. All right. <laughs> Not sure if it's worth to fly 1,500 kilometers now. All right. Thanks, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed. Thank you.